when I started the bowl rule. <coughs> we were talking about yesterday. That when he's a human being is the past, the present and the future. He's he's time bound. He invents his own time. He is the result of all human endeavor. He's like the tide we said yesterday that goes out and comes in. This is a perpetual motion in which he's caught. And we should, I think, talk over together whether that this movement of the outer and the inner interrelated not really radically, not separate, like a, the water going out and the water coming back. Whether that movement has ever a stop. Or must it always continue? And what is that state of mind which is not caught in this tidal <coughs> movement. And considering what the world is becoming, utterly immoral, corrupt, without any sense of integrity, what is our responsibility as scientists, as philosophers, as ordinary human beings like us? What is our responsibility? And if we do undertake certain responsibility, will it ever change this enormous disintegration that I am glad that opened for us to discuss. As educated human beings, so-called educated, do we ever consider of other people at all, <coughs> or are we only concerned <coughs> with ourselves, with our becoming, with our achievements, totally neglecting our relationship with each other and with the world? I would like to discuss these points. Doesn't somebody want to come and sit here? Nice and comfortable here. <coughs> Won't you come some? There are plenty of rooms, sir. Don't be nervous, sir, please. I won't bite. <laughs> What have the scientists achieved? They have certainly given us extraordinary technological progress. And also they are responsible for the instruments of war, for the instruments of destruction of other human beings by the million or by the thousand. They have invented the atom bomb, and also they have invented the computer, the robot, and all the technological necessities of life, which is essential. But also they have invented the biological warfare, 
the destruction of human beings by the untold number which has been going on for the last 5,000 historical process, that is, war every year. And those who are responsible for this are the educated, so-called educated people. The professors and their students, the learned, the men in power, has not been able to solve any of these problems. That's the human problems, human misery, the terrible agony that human beings go through. So what do we do? What's your responsibility? Do, do we verbally enjoy exchange of words, exchange of theories, or is it possible for human beings like us to transform or empty our consciousness of all the travail, the conflicts, the miseries? It seems to me that the crucial question is um, this fundamental question of whether changes in people we normally think of as individuals affect everybody else and affect the whole world. And the difficulty of the question seems to me to be this, that if such a change had already happened at any time in human history and had transformed humanity, we wouldn't be in the position we're in now if there'd already been this total transformation. So the fact this transformation has not occurred, which is the reason for the present state of the world, means that we're talking about something which, for which there's no precedent, which has never occurred. And therefore it seems to me it's extremely difficult for us to know whether such a thing is possible. Is it wishful thinking to think that if some change occurs in us or in anyone else, that um, humanity would be transformed? We have no historical evidence for this being possible. I don't think humanity as a whole can be transformed. But, but then can what is, is my consciousness and yours and hers, is it too, so very different from the consciousness of the rest of mankind? The rest of mankind, whether they live in America or the rest of it, they are like there is my consciousness, miserable and happy, incredibly insecure, belief in some outside agencies, God and so on and so on. My, uh, my consciousness is almost similar, if I'm in that position, to the rest of man. So I'm questioning whether we are individuals at all. Not in the totalitarian sense, which denies, you know, that I won't go into the Marxist theories and all the rest of it. So I'm questioning whether there is individuality at all. And if one human being transforms radically, fundamentally, his consciousness, the content of his consciousness, will it not affect the rest of men, rest of the consciousness of man? Yes. But 
The question is, is the present consciousness of man, since there have been various people in the past who've undoubtedly undergone unusual transformations, Buddha and so on, um, can we say that the present state of mankind is already a result of these kinds of transformations which we might think of as for the better, and all these rather negative and destructive tendencies? Um, and if there are further transformations, will it merely change the balance a little in one direction, or is it possible for the whole of humanity, mankind, to be radically transformed permanently? No, but can I, as, a, as an ordinary human being, can we not radically change? I'm not talking of general humanity. Mm. I'm talking about your consciousness, my consciousness, hers, is very similar. And so, if I, perhaps, if I can change, empty my consciousness for all the travail and the misery of existence, perhaps I'll affect the whole content of human consciousness. That's all I'm saying. And is it possible for me, as a human being, to totally empty my consciousness of all the contradictions and lack of integrity, the absurd beliefs or sane beliefs, all that throw it over and be totally free as a human being? If I can bring that about, perhaps, I may affect the whole of consciousness of man. Like Hitler has affected the consciousness of man. Like the Buddha, like anybody. You know, they have affected the consciousness of man. Is it merely an empirical matter? In any case, I think, had these <coughs> enlightened beings not attained enlightenment, I think things would have been incalculably worse than they are. That's one thing. But I think even that's probably not the point. But I think Krishnaji's earlier uh, reference to the possibility of, uh, of contagion, but I think it's, it's more alchemical and mysterious than this even, the, the, the way in which the enlightened consciousness touches everything else. And I, I don't think we are meant to, <clears throat> to know in advance I think this might itself be a, a, a disincentive and a pollutant, it seems to me. Of course, this can easily become a, 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 a ground for escape, but it doesn't have to. I think there is, there is a, a kind of greed involved in, in, in wanting to know precisely how all manner of uh, worthwhile results are going to be attained. Whereas I think there is something here, if I may be permitted, to draw upon the purely moral notion of a categorical imperative, something which simply has got to be done. Now, I think apart from <clears throat> the category of things like, oh, helping your neighbor in distress and so on, which simply have got to be done, there is also this, this call of, uh, of consciousness. And I think if, if it were really, and I think it certainly is a categorical imperative, then they, uh, clearly not to do that would be to add to the number of uh, kinds of wrongdoing that already exist. And I, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the suggestion of Krishnaji and others in the past and, and in, in recent times uh, that uh, where there is no sense, there are no others in, in of course, a, a much more radical way, so that in, in so far as one a man, woman, radically alters, all are two in some invisible way. And I think a, a sufficiently <clears throat> insightful history would be able to demonstrate this in the case of uh, the Buddha and Jesus mm. and Sri Krishna mm. and others. But even if this were not possible, if this is a, a categorical imperative, we are the kind of being that must seek its own absolute center, put it that way, that we simply must get on with the job. Well, the question wasn't either what will the exact change be like, and can we predict the exact details? Nor was it whether or not we should do it, but whether or not this transformation is possible. And 
it seems to me the difficulty of the question is that if it, if it, ha I mean, it hasn't happened to me. I know that it may have happened indirectly to me through other people in a subtle way, so on. But for something that hasn't actually happened, that we haven't actually directly experienced or known or recognised ourselves, we may see the possibility of it in others or be encouraged to think. We may wish. I mean, I deeply wish that these things would be possible. I really want them to be possible. Sure, but shouldn't, shouldn't we? investigate that question, whether it's possible yes, or not. that's what I'm saying. This I know, is a I know fundamental you, question. That's, that's a fundamental question. That's what you're saying. Is it possible, actually, yes. not theoretically, yes. to bring about... Let's talk over it. Let's discuss it. Are we talking about uh, uh, the possibility of changing the consciousness of mankind? Or are we talking about the possibility of totally emptying the content of consciousness as is today? Krishnati, one thing I, you have to understand. You might say we are the consciousness of mankind, but we are islands. The, the mainland may be also Earth. We are also Earth, but we are islands. And therefore, we can't think of it as a consciousness I am of not mankind. Thinking of therefore. Uh, all right, let's forget the whole. <laughs> let's forget the rest of mankind. I am the mankind. But yes, that is it. I am mankind. I am the result of mankind. All their misery, I am all that. My consciousness is in a state of utter confusion, conflict, anxiety, loneliness, despair, depression, immense sorrow. I'm all, it's all there. Now I'm asking you, is it possible to totally be free of all that? Otherwise, life has no meaning. I'm born, die. If I believe in reincarnation, that's just another flippant theory. But actually, I have only this life. And if, I, if I'm to live that way, I don't see the point of living that way. There's no meaning in it. I may be rich, I may be poor, I may be very scholarly and very clever, but what, what at the end of it all? I may build temples and go all the rest of that nonsense. At the end of it, I am left what, where it began. So I say to myself, is it possible radically empty this stupid existence, not commit suicide, empty? That's what I would like to discuss. The birth of this tragedy and this total chaos, I think, is due to oblivion of human existence. I mean, man is, man's inner existence has been completely forgotten. I mean, man's, as you said, fear, anxiety, loneliness has been alienated from all sorts of things now from his own family, from nature, from <laughs> other institutions. Are you saying this all been eliminated? Not soul, self. I mean the human existence, human as such, man as such, man as such who has got fear, loneliness, isolation, and all these <coughs> things, you know, with all this embodiment, he has been forgotten totally. Uh -huh. And we are perceiving nothing but uh, mathematics and physics you know, and all this is nothing but impact of the mathematics and physics you know, and we have lost totally the human existence you know, meaning of uh, living that would presume that there was a time when there was no fear there was no greed but the human existence right from the beginning have shown all these elements and we are no different basically to what uh, your uh, four forefathers were. I we agree with you. Of all that. I don't think there's basically any difference. 
I agree with you, but uh, there was no total chaos in the degree of the insecurity, what today we feel, and previously. But I suppose that today was in the seed of, of that complacency which we have, may have had 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Are you saying well, pa there's partial chaos? No, he says that uh, uh, the, degree of chaos. the degree of chaos has been very greatly increased because of the increase in technology, science, and Whatever the reason I am there, you may, I may invent 10,000 reasons, but the fact is I am living in this chaos. I think much of the difficulty is that most of the time one is not aware that one is living in this chaos, except at a very superficial level and occasionally. Otherwise one is lost in an, a stream of unawareness, it's only on an occasion like this that one becomes a little aware that there is chaos. I think you are, if I may insist or pursue, you're not answering my question. And the ordinary man caught in this wheel, and what am I? What, what am I to do or not do? Well, the answer surely must be an emphatic yes uh, to the question whether uh, this total transformation is possible. The answer must be an emphatic yes. I say for myself it is possible. You may, I don't want you to accept it or uh, deny it, but I say it is possible. Then where are you? <coughs> Well, I think even this initial first step needs to be taken more, uh, more comprehensively and more carefully, I think, and more many-sidedly than it has uh, uh, been taken so far. But may I respond to a, a point that has arisen in, 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 in the uh, statements just made by Pupulji and, and others? It occurs to me that, again, we might commit the fallacy of comparison of a terrible mess. But I think things are, as it were, just as the felicity of enlightenment is qualitatively different from any other kind of felicity, so the badness of this badness is, is bad enough. I mean, comparisons are not really called for. So it's pretty bad, and it must always have been like that. But I, I, I accept the, the, the remark made by our friend there uh, that uh, it's a question of awareness, but also I think of, of a radical kind of awareness even of, of the misery of this not just of a comparative kind, but it really is rock bottom. I mean, it couldn't be worse than this. That's what I mean, uh, an awareness which is re real awareness, not uh, some kind of a theoretical right. awareness. Right, of completely unself-deceiving kind. And, and I, I think that must surely be, be another of the first steps. <clears throat> Do you mean to say what we are intensely aware of a chaos and meaninglessness? <coughs> Can we correct ourselves? Is there any possibility of our transformation? Well, if awareness can, can <clears throat> survive its object, namely total meaninglessness, that is ground for hope, I think. But if awareness doesn't cancel itself <laughs> when it has as its object this completely despairing thing, that is itself a ground for hope, I think. Oh, the mind, you one's not meant to, to dance and sing about it straight away. But surely that it has been possible for human beings to take a completely unself-deceiving look and still survive that moment of recognition. I should have thought is itself, however poorly instantiated though this recognition may be, is ground for hope. And I, I think that really is, is uh, splendid uh, news uh, to... Uh, May I, may I uh, suggest an analogy? Supposing when somebody says there are cures for cancer, but these are ad hoc cures. But supposing a, an announcement to the effect that we have understood the cause of cancer. I think this itself begins to work in its own silent way. So there might be, for instance, a, a short-term palliatives of one kind or another, and they may not work. But supposing somebody, in, in some corner of the world, in a, in, a, in a completely believable way and sort of scientifically um, established way, announces the, the cure 
of cancer and, and the, the understanding of the process at the same time. I think that is, that is in itself a pure first step. A lot of <coughs> very, <coughs> it seems to me, I may be wrong, I just share this with you, uh, a lot of very uh, hasty announcements of new, uh, new uh, uh, plans for the world and so on suffer from, uh, from a, a, a lack of conviction at the heart because there is no real understanding of the causality of misery. Whereas if, if, uh, if in, in our understanding of uh, radically transformed human beings in the past and in the present, we are able to boldly, without hesitation, make such an announcement to ourselves first and, and to others, Shall I think I will be taking the first step. Please do. I come to you, professors and scientists, learned people. I come to you with my misery, with my loneliness, all the rest of it. What do you do with me? Give me with words, she tells me to be aware, you tell me something else, and he tells me something else. What you're not? I want water. You don't. You give me words. <coughs> what am I to do, or not do? What? What way am I to change? How? What makes me change? Sorrow. I've I've had a lot of sorrow. Lot of problems. Knocks on the head. I haven't changed. I've read, if I've read, I hope I've not, all the sacred books and all the rest of it. I'm at the end of it all, I'm just left where I am. After a million years, just where we started. Fear, anxiety, and all the rest of it. And I come to you and say, please, sirs, you're all so well and learned. Please help me. Don't tell me theories. Don't tell me if you are aware or should be aware, how much awareness, all those are meaningless to me. What am I to do? I think as persistent an inquirer uh, as yourself in, in this uh, uh, make-believe uh, situation would, would himself bring hope to, to those whom he asks this question. I, I should have thought so. No, if, if, if uh, the inquirer is as persistent as, as yourself in this kind of imagined context, then the persons he would ask would in themselves be transformed a bit, I am convinced. Help me to investigate. I will investigate, but I can't go very f much further. Well, this is Help me, sir, don't... Give me water. Yes, but I think it would be presumptuous to, to offer something which is not water, but to welcome, <laughs> welcome you in, in, the, in, the, in the community of inquirers and to say, let us inquire. Let's inquire. Let's inquire. All right. Let's yes. inquire. Yes. yes. I think they do that. Let's, let's yes. inquire. Where do I start? I think where do we start, then it would become that. The question yeah. would be where? Well, I'm putting myself ordinary man. Where do I start? With myself. If you, if you say, start with yourself. Now, how am I to look at myself? What's the mirror in which I can see all my reactions, all the thoughts, all the misery, you follow? In which I can see actually, not theoretically, actually, brutally see what I am. Where? There is no mirror like that. I think the loved one is ah. a mirror. Ah, you see, you've gone off already. Loved. Loved one. I loved don't know what you're talking about, loved one. I think I love my wife. Well, <laughs> yeah, but do you not see in her a, a I mean, comparable a, misery? No, don't, don't, don't tell no. me that. My wife. She's a bore, and I'm a bore to her. And what? We are accustomed to each other. We have irritated each other. We have bullied each other. Possessed each other sexually in every other way. At the end of ten years, I have God. So where do I look? I think 
and the miserable children will be the mirror. Oh, no. <laughs> I wish I hadn't brought them into the world, because the world is pretty miserable. I'm crying over it, and you'll just give me something, a handkerchief to wipe my eyes, tears. I am. I'm. I don't want your handkerchief. Why do you need a mirror? Huh? Why do you need a mirror? Where do I look? I said. Where do I look so as to be very clear that I don't deceive myself? You look at the ground. Huh? You look at the ground from which this springs. Yes. Where is the ground? My mind. My mind. Tell me. Show me what my mind is. It's so. Perverted, so distorted, so degenerate. Your education has done all this to me. Still, I can look at the perversion, distortion. Why are you saying that it is not possible to I look at I don't say it's not possible. Perversion, distortion. My mind, my brain <coughs> functions in a very, very small, narrow groove. So I will see the narrow groove. Yes. I see, do I see it, or is it an idea that my mind is an arrow, is in an arrow group? You, you said, in what mirror will I look? I can only look very clearly in my relationship to another. No, sir. That is the mirror. Sir, I, I, this is something which I, I... When you say relationship with another, even that act sprouts from the mind, from the ground of the mind. Even the, that which accompanies my relationship to another, the sprouting of that is in the ground of my mind. Yes, proceed. So, when you say, I see myself <coughs> in the mirror of relationship, it is really seeing the ground from which the sprouting has been. So whether narrow, wide, yes, it is still the ground. Proceed, help me a little bit more. So what is the difficulty in perceiving that ground? It's really, is it possible? And with what instruments will I perceive <laughs> that ground and the sprouting from that ground. With what shall I uh, face The it? only instrument I have is this terrible thought. Thought is that which sprouts. And don't... Yeah, I, yes. I have only that thought. No, I have sir. only the instrument with which to look thought. Yes. I've cultivated, so I let me finish please, I've cultivated thought for a million years and that's the only instrument I have. And with that instrument you are telling me to look. And before I look, you say, look at the ground from which thought has arisen. Is that it? No, sir. I say, Thought first makes that inquiry. Thought says it can look at the ground, but it also has other instruments. Don't limit it to thought. The, the other instruments is seeing, tasting, smelling, and <laughs> senses. Yes, they are the senses are my misery. <laughs> they are also my instruments. My instrument. And I'm only partially aware or use one or two senses. Yes. I never use my all the fullness of my senses. Yes, but before I can even get to the fullness of my senses, the starting point of inquiry may be partial, but I, I the starting point partial. of the inquiry will be thought and the instruments which I have, which are my senses, to perceive the ground. The instrument I have is thought and desire. 
and also instrument I have to see, to listen, to feel. Yes, sir, which is all translated into desire. Why, sir? Right. No? Why do you say that? I it's see a beautiful house I want it. I see a beautiful woman I want her. I see a lovely uh, car I want it. It's the seeing is translated into the desire of having. Yes, but there is a sea <coughs> of this desire for the car sprouting in the mind. Yes, yes, of course it's sprouting so in the, the mind. That is the first movement. I'm then all trying right, to all right. Then what is my mind? What is the quality of my mind? Are we separating the mind from the brain? Would you help me, sir? Are we separating the brain from the mind? Then what is the mind which is so very different from the brain? Is the mind different from the brain? Uh, that's why I'm questioning. I, I like you to see, go into this. More, you, the, you perceive the sprouting. You neither perceive the mind nor the brain. Yes. Quite right. So what? So the words mind and brain in terms of the mirror have no meaning. Yes. So where am I left at the end of this? You, are, you said, where will I perceive, where will I come in contact? And I'm trying to see whether we can proceed into this question. Please proceed there. <laughs> in contradiction is a word that occurred in, in one of your recent lectures. I think such a man, as the one you uh, pretend to be in this conversation, must be embarrassed by the uh, contradiction in his whole... If the I, the himself, is so uh, so troublesome, and is indeed so so pervasive, why does he limit it to just this one finite being? I think this is in itself a first-class contradiction to confront the, the miserable man with. That on the one hand, you have made a cosmos of this I in its complaint about its misery, and then you have restricted this very I to just one tiny place in the universe, Either you should consistently deny uh, any substantiality to this I, or you should universalize it, cosmicize it, and do not, uh, not regard your I as other than any. I think this con contradiction, perhaps in our own times, our, our logic-ridden times, I think there might be some irony in, in this even, I think, to confront uh, individuals with this straight contradiction and not with any moralisms merely. Uh, I, I, I have risked a straight answer to your question, sir. I was reminded of, um, of a, a metaphorical story from uh, our traditional knowledge about the Kiradatiniya. When you talk about the misery, how overpowering the misery is, and when I hear uh, Mr. Ramchandra Gandhi talk about the cosmic troublesome eye, Arjuna went to do tapas. <coughs> Uh, to be able to get uh, Shiva to come and sort of greet him, uh, embrace him, and give him some additional powers. And naturally, he went into a forest to get rid of all the normal disturbances. And while he was doing it, a hunter appeared. At the time Shiva was to appear, instead a hunter appeared, chasing an animal. And Arjuna, of course, said, look, don't disturb me. Don't you see I'm meditating, I'm a king? And he said, I don't know who you are. You do your thing, I do my thing. They fought. Arjuna used all his powers and was completely overpowered. In fact, he was so completely exhausted <coughs> that he could not even close his eyes when he was put back on his back. In this utter shame, in not being able to close his eyes, he looks and sees on the top of the hunter's head the crescent moon. And at this point, he realizes that in fact, having exhausted all devices that were at his disposal, that what he had already been wanting at the back of his mind and wanted to remove the disturbances has appeared. It appears to me that uh, the onset of misery which you so poignantly and so eloquently portrayed is not necessarily a bad thing because a little misery is much worse than a lot of misery because if the misery can completely overtake you, completely transform your world, 
then you see that in fact minor palliatives are simply no good. If I owe somebody 100 rupees and don't have the money, I would be very concerned. If I owe somebody one crore of rupees and there is simply no way I could pay it back, then I would really have to devise some totally new strategies which could not be. So the, the misery that surrounds us, I don't, for one, really agree with the statement either that the scientists are responsible for the misery or that the misery is so overpowering. After all, it's the same technology which produces these television things and these various things so that your words could be carried to more people. Uh, but assuming for the time being that we go along with the fantasy and metaphor of absolute misery, absolute misery is a very good thing because if it's really so absolute, then you will have to do something about it. And in many ways, if I had a friend who came to me saying that my misery is so overpowering, nobody ever had this kind of misery, I would try to first of all illustrate that there is, it's not so great because other people also have misery. And secondly, eliminate all intermediate strategies that are used to hold it back for just a time. To make things totally hopeless by saying that this method does not lead to anything at all. So part of the love that um, Ramsudra talked about is really also saying that, look, these things don't work. You are not as miserable as you could be because if only you will realize that these are temporary things, you could be more miserable and uh, uh, make a total transformation. So the transformations don't come because your misery is removed. Sometimes great misery could be the threshold for a yes, total sir. transcendence. All right. All right. I am that, I am that misery, I am at the threshold. Who, what, who will push me over the threshold? Sir, I take issue with Dr. Tudarshan on two points. One is that I don't think as a scientist he can disown the curse that his tribe has held over humanity during our lifetime. It did not exist when I was a young man. It exists today. Man's capacity to wipe out life on this planet. This is certainly something which did not exist before. The second thing that you said is also to my mind quite uh, open to question. So both the things that you have said I think are slightly rhetorical because you must admit that we are facing a totally new crisis, at least the intensity of the crisis. I don't think man has ever been faced with the crisis of his survival as he is today and that he is responsible for it. That is the responsibility of man has never been so total as it is in 1982. But may I ask what relationship this has with uh, this uh, First of all, so I think he's the, talking with the, his tongue in his No, chin. but no, I, if I may, no, I, no, I'm if, if I uh, can ask a question, do we really want to empty the content of one's consciousness? That is what I'm saying. I mean, that, no, 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 please. Do we really want to empty the content of, of my, do I want to empty the content of my consciousness? I think that is the fundamental question. It's no use your saying, give me water and... Unless I say, yes, I want to relieve, I can, I'm prepared to face it and face the consequences. It. And in the real tantric sense, put my neck into that, under that sword with, and press the stirrups with my own feet to cut off my own head. I think to, to draw attention to the irrationality of not emptying the pot overflowing with misery. I, I think that there is an irrationality. And I, I, I think this is important because of the self-image of modern man as a rational being. It may not be the only style of, of no. this spiritual therapy, which, uh, but it may be one way of, of embarrassing no, uh, if, deeply. If, if one says one wants to be empty, then one can possibly 
open the door or go or even move towards the threshold. No, but an overflowing pot of misery not being emptied is about the most splendid piece of irrationality that I can think of. Now, of course, the man is still vain. I think often then the, the way is to, to make holes in the pot. I do think so, and I think this, 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 this marvelous Socratic Zen uh, 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 conversation that Krishnaji has initiated is one way of drilling holes in that pot, because we are, of course, too vain to, to empty it. But I think we must shoot straight into that pot by, by argument and by example and so on. Uh, and that's, that's one way. Otherwise, he will never own this, your question. Do you want to? He of course I do. No, he, won't. he might say different. He may have emptied the pot, but... I was going to ask him when he said, give me water. I said, it's really your having to give the water. Yeah, to, 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 to keep the drains uh, functioning within oneself is one way. Really. <laughs> I stand accused by two of the most excellent people here. And uh, I must at least put up my own defense. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> With your tongue in your cheek still. <laughs> the... There is a great deal of notion that modern man is rational, modern man is scientific, modern man is objective, that science is objective, we are dominated by science, we are dominated by technology. I believe these, all these are um, statements which one has heard and not really produced, because ultimately the decision of how much objective truth is to be accepted is a subjective judgment. And the question of uh, whether the whole world began in a Big Bang or um, whether um, we originated in a cosmic soup is really something which ultimately we have to decide whether the argumentation is right, whether the judgments are right, whether the premises are right. And eventually, uh, if we feel that things are not uh, really acceptable to us, we will say, I disregard this particular whole line of argumentation. I don't know any of those things and nor did these people know they were not there. And I shall now attempt a totally new construction. Similarly, with regard to the question of relating to the world, and what are the rational methods, what are the practicable methods of dealing with the thing, again, is based on a certain set of subjective value judgments. And at a certain point, whether it be by ultimate misery or by um, the end of a long dialogue in which you are painted into a corner, or by a flash of insight, or by no reason whatever, if you are convinced that this particular worldview is not satisfactory, one will change it. Not necessarily for something better, but one will change it. The reason why one does not change the worldview is because of the fact that one is really not convinced that all the statements about misery are. And I, for one, would like to challenge um, Achirji, uh, but this would be a very unequal combat because he will defeat me if I were to do it in public. Uh, but. I would like to say that all of us who are here are reasonably comfortable in the world. In fact, I have not seen one person who is really miserable in here. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, nobody is thirsty here. Nobody has gone hungry. Nobody has not enough to wear or even to know that uh, there is food for tomorrow or day after. There is a great deal of law and order despite all the lawlessness and corruption that one is talking about. Modern life is stressful, but not necessarily as insecure as one tries to make it out. I have somehow the conviction that even if I didn't do any, a jot of work, I will not starve for the rest of my life. One could be mistaken about it. And I have lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on, so President Kennedy addressed the nation on the television and said, well, maybe this is it, this is the big thing, and we will not be around. And you would certainly feel a little different. But I have also undergone surgery. And the doctor said, maybe not much will happen to you, but maybe it would be a wise idea to set your affairs in order and write letters and whatever it is. You feel different at the end of that particular thing. You're a little surprised that you're back again in the same whole world. So I, while the, the idea about the nuclear destruction of the world or uh, large-scale <laughs> warfare and so on are there, Life goes on much more. In fact, the small wars, small disturbances create more problems than the large disturbances. So it seems to me that 
the misery of the world is a little exaggerated for most of us and probably for the majority of people who are seeking. And it seems to me, I used to think that the old days were much better days. It seems to me that the possibilities of uh, encountering oneself is very much greater at the present time than any time in history perhaps. That maybe there was a time millions of years ago when people were much freer. But it seems to me today there are very many more opportunities for people to be reminded of the fact that uh, transformation begins with oneself rather than in the outside world. Uh, I'm I'm accused always of being clever and being sophisticated and tricky and so on, but this comes from my heart. I think that at the present time, there is more opportunity for a person to be a mamukshu rather than at any time in the past. The other thing I want to say is that I'm a teacher. I have been a teacher for many decades now. And uh, the art of teaching is in fact being able to be one with the student whom you teach. And a good teacher is one, not necessarily one who is very clever or very learned, but who can, in some sense, both be at his level as well as the student's level. So that you are able to communicate things. You are communicating more to the student in you than the student outside. And this transformation, it seems to me, is also the same when somebody comes to you in misery. How do you communicate? If you can internalize that person's problem, or if you can enlarge your awareness to be able to absorb both that person's position and your position. If you simply become one with him and say, agree that the world is very miserable, you're not doing him any favor. You're just making yourself miserable. You may feel less guilty, but you're not doing any good. That uh, communication at this particular level, love at this level, involves the art of teaching, involves the art of being able to, uh, to comprehend, to, I mean, maintain two different levels of awareness at the same time, your own and the other one, and then you can bring the two together because they are both parts of yourself. George, would you not say that if there are many special uh, opportunities today to, uh, to seek freedom, there are also many special opportunities for forgetting these things? I think the two tend to sometimes cancel <coughs> each other out. I accept your statement, but I think on the other side, the, the, the forgetfulness of our times uh, is, is really also as, as tragic as the, the other, I think, is, 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 is welcome. I, I, think, so, I think this does alter the, the diagnosis a bit. I think it does. But about the other thing, I, I do wish to suggest to you that even if uh, uh, nobody here is miserable, if you attribute to us enough empathy, I think many of us are, not for ourselves, for our little tiny selves here, that uh, given that empathy, we many of us, I bet, are, are very miserable. But of course, they're not going to frown all the time. I think that's uh, that's not the, the the best kind of expression of empathy either. But deep down, they they are they are they, they feel terrible. And uh, I don't want to speak in the first person. I feel terrible, and I'm sure so many do because of the the <clears throat> the hunger of others. And I, I wish this sense of identity could be so. Uh, so complete that we would also really, uh, uh, like uh, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, uh, 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 suffer pangs. But uh, not all of us are gifted in that way. But in some small way, I, I think. But empathy, again, doesn't go far enough because I think it is itself founded on the view that the other is other than me. I think until we achieve that perfect identity or perfect vacuity, one of the two, I think there are only these two stark choices, really. But I mean, I, this is in response to your, to your reprimand. I mean, I accept it, like your first uh, uh, diagnosis, but there's the other side. May I ask one question? There is one factor which I think is present in the human mind and human consciousness, and that's the factor of curiosity. It, uh, I mean, uh, probably a lot of scientific investigation, a lot of investigation has in various other areas, has been the man desire to find out, to know, to inquire. Why is it that when it comes to a, this curiosity being used to discover the spaces, the distances, the whole structure of the human mind and, it, and consciousness and the depths which lie beyond, why do we get balked? Why do we put up obstacles ourselves to this curiosity penetrating? 
because probably it's as great an unmapped surface which remains to be investigated as any other sphere. Why is it that man's inquiry is being <coughs> it never is pushed? What you are saying by directly challenging George that He's saying this in it. No, before never has so. man perversely striven for degeneration, misusing all his capacities, primarily by the misuse of his brain, to the point of bringing an entire culture to its, demi to its demise. I say, the problem of regeneration has achieved a great urgency today because man seems hell-bent on destroying such culture as he has. I don't think uh, I agree uh, that I am breaking an important rule of this assembly by bringing in the factor of time because when I say urgency, that means I am in time. Uh, I am aware of this contradiction, but I feel that this urgency cannot be wiped out. And the fact that you refuse to take note of it, that the urgency does not become less because you see that man himself is striving his utmost to destroy. That is the survival not of physically, the atom is destroying the physical world. But there is such a thing as the mind destroying its own heritage of all human culture, that is to say like the end of an epoch. Now I feel that there is something today in the West and there is something in India, I suppose it must be everywhere. There is an appalling degeneration. And this degeneration exists side by side <coughs> with some of the best minds. Now, I feel that this problem of regeneration, therefore, has attained an urgency in time which, I insist, cannot be just brushed aside. If that urgency is so monumental, then it would have found expression. The fact is we sit around. No. You see, ma, permit me that when we sit with Krishnaji, we sit here because I have heard him say this 50 years ago and it could ring no bell. When he talked of freedom, I told him that oh, the British were far more important than what he was talking. When he was talking of something, I could tell him that no sir, something else is more important. Today, I have really come to the point of finding that all my defenses have collapsed. And I had to accept that there is a priority to the problem of regeneration, which we can only ignore if we are blind as bats. And I feel that our top scientists and top philosophers are blind as bats because they are trying their best to ignore it. But he's, he, has, he actually said that never has there been a time more propitious for this kind of thing. I know this, but he said something else also. <coughs> well, <laughs> I have the feeling we are digressing, but I mean, since it's a I direct question, no, no, direct question, I must answer it. I believe at the present time, the greatest danger to the world is from the confusion in the minds of people than from the nuclear weapons. Because nuclear weapons are not under the command of the scientists. By the way, weapon making is not a scientific tradition, but a technology tradition. It is an engineering field and not a scientific field. <laughs> but let's, we have a department of science and technology, so let's put, put the two together. But the weapons are not under the control or in any country of scientists. The weapons are at the control of the, of the administrators, the leaders of the country, who are ordinary citizens, very often, who refuse to take understand the science of the situation. It is, if there is a responsibility of destruction, potential destruction or threat of destruction, it is carried out by the leaders of the country who are elected by the ordinary people and not by the scientists. 
I am, however, much more concerned with something else for which the scientists are responsible, and that is the the tacit acceptance of a of a negative um, uh, philosophy of darkness, of basically saying that the whole world is purposeless, that in fact the atoms and molecules, or uh, genes and chromosomes, or um, fields and um, their interactions are the only things in the world. There are no value judgments, there are no purposes, there is no such thing as enlightenment. In fact, there is almost a prohibition, I don't think it is written down, but almost a prohibition for anybody who is interested in consciousness or enlightenment from holding high office in the scientific and university traditions in this country at the present time. Uh, a very eminent scientist who was in charge of the national, I mean, advising the national defense was basically eased out simply because he felt that the spiritual search was a legitimate search and asserted that in print. The reason that is possible is not only because of the scientists, because in fact the other intellectuals and other citizens of the country are unwilling to take exception to the statement. There was a big science congress in Mysore. You look at the totally <coughs> political science congress, it's major policy statements were made by the leaders of the country. But there is no statement about consciousness, awareness, consciousness, investigation into the nature of perception being the last frontier. All the statements are about technology, about science, about weaponry, increasing production, uh, export earnings and so on. So at the present time, the danger threatening our country as well as the world is coming in from the ascendancy of the philosophy of darkness, a philosophy which is hostile and inimical to enlightenment and not from the scientists. It is true that if it were not for the scientists, many of these things would not have happened. But if it were not for the scientists, we would not have produced the same amount of food. We would not be all together. I have traveled 10,000 miles to be here. It simply would not have been possible. So uh, technology is, has, uh, uh, science and technology is not the thing which determines it. It's the people who make the thing. People press the button. People make the decisions with regard to it. But to come back to the statement uh, about um, uh, question of intellectuals not being aware. I would like to submit that in fact, if intellectuals do it, it is only because of the fact that the nation supports it. Who challenges the intellectuals' right to say what is the nature of reality? Um, and in a practical sense, what people do is not to, en uh, to enter into a direct confrontation, but there has been no time in which um, adventures in consciousness has been more widely pursued in this country and in the world than at the present time. Maybe at medieval times. But on the other hand, don't forget the fact that at that time the people who pursued the thing were a very limited number of people in monasteries and cathedrals. But now it is the people all over the place. Even this atrocious music at five o'clock in the morning in which everybody competes with everything else. If you come right down to it, it is seems to be partly stemming from the fact of making people aware early in the morning as they wake up about certain things which they are likely to forget. I continue to hold the opinion that this is the time when there is greater awareness of the need for doing something radical. Uh, I also would like to say that there is a greater urgency now because the pace of life has quickened, that everybody is busy, Every, everything is happening a little too fast. If you don't do something about it, you will find that your wealth is wiped out, your position is eroded, your house is occupied, and then, uh, your uh, yard is overgrown. Everything happens faster, but uh, good things happen along with the bad things. So I'm, uh, I'm afraid I somehow seem to be speaking for an elitist, uh, complacent position. No, I'm not doing that. I'm simply saying that uh, it seems to me that this is the time when there is greater awareness of the genuine nature of our misery. But somehow or other, it does not find a unified expression in the country that uh, uh, there are a few isolated people who talk about it, but the standard position of the country is that uh, science is for the for, uh, saving of humanity or science is for the defense of the country, rather than to say science enables you to see it is like spectacles. It enhances your view of the world and that having seen that particular thing, you should be much better able to understand the nature of causation. And it seems to me that physics should be made a compulsory subject for everybody, uh, somewhere along the line, adult education, to show what is the nature of causation. Because that's in fact what we are talking about. 
that somehow, once you see the chain of causation, then like the Buddha, perhaps one would be able to see what is the origin of misery. George, you give with one hand and you take away with another. <laughs> I mean, for instance, <clears throat> if there is greater awareness today, there is also very great skepticism about any possibility of a way out in theoretical, intellectual, professional circles. Now, of course, I think you responded splendidly to the moral indictment of scientists. But you yourself indicted them even more thoroughly when you said that their theoretical worldview, of course, is all wrong. Now, I don't think you can escape that responsibility, George. You can't. Because if the theoretical worldview inspired by ongoing science is so dismal, then I think that's a far greater responsibility than any particular collaboration between scientists and politicians. And I think that's re also, I, I do, do, do feel that <clears throat> we must not base any right effort on fear alone. I remember reading a very clever phrase about that, that man does not live by dread alone. But, but I, I think, the, the, because I feel that whether or not the world is in danger, worldliness seems to me to be no danger at all today. And that's a terrible thing. I think, you know, if we only think the world is in danger, but, but we, we keep worldliness intact, I don't think we are going to make... We may survive a war for the next 50 years, but I think it will be there in, in the next 100 years. I think the very idea of worldliness, and I don't mean in any, any sort of uh, renunciate sense, this, this, this phrase, but, but that, that, that this is all that there is, that the, the pratyaksha pramana, is all that there is, and not even in, in the profound sense of awareness, but no, in, in the gross, stola sense of whatever. I, I think that if theoretical scientists, and indeed theoretical workers, do not question the very fundamentals of modern thought, very boldly, I think, I, I see no hope. In fact, I think politicians may, 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 may possess this survival instinct more than scientists, and they may just manage to save the world. I think scientists, like other intellectual workers today in the modern world, tend to, to suffer from a despairing nihilism. And I think they may, they may push the, the button. But I, 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 you know, uh, it's, it's very strange that the, the, the very politicians whom, whom one hates may, in fact, because uh, they, they want to win the next elections, want the world to survive the, uh, until that time, or something like that. So I, 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 I'm really digressing and discussing the responsibility of scientists. <laughs> But I think we were invited to do that, what Krishnaji said, as scientists, as philosophers, and so on. I don't think we're digressing, really. Sir, uh, may I have a word? We have two senses in which the word can be used, the word misery. Dr. Sudarshan was very illuminating when he talked about misery in the first sense, namely, that misery can be put out, eradicate. Probably a regeneration of man, transformation of the world, could take place. Perhaps we are not miserable at all. And science could do a lot in this direction. There is absolutely no doubt about it. I don't think there is any difference of opinion with regard to it. We can grant it. But the second sense which appears to be more important and more fundamental is that the very finitude of man itself is a problem. The finitude of man can never be eradicated by sheer physical science and its methods. There must be some other method <coughs> whereby we can transcend this sense of finitude, this self-alienation, man alienating from himself, standing aloof from himself as it were. This is the dread. This is the dread. And this dread of nothingness into which we pass inevitably. No science can put it off. No science can prevent it. Man faces nothingness, the abyss or the dread of death, the emptiness. The nothingness. How are we going to get out of it? I think that sort of misery in that fundamental sense must have to be tackled. I think it cannot be tackled by science. But it's traditionally tackled by religion. And the answer, to go back to this case of the man who's so miserable and says, what can I do? Give me water. The traditional answer of most of the great religions of the world is to give people water. And um, it's to say that liberation is possible or salvation is possible and that these are the ways to do it. It may or may not happen in this life. It may happen in a future life or it may happen after death in another kind of existence. And this is the traditional sphere in which not science but religion offers an answer. Now, <clears throat> I know that... Um, I mean, this seems to me a huge question as to... Uh, whether or not the religious answers are valid or not. 
I don't think one can dismiss the whole lot on the basis of a vague dismissal of the historical faults of world religions. And it seems to me that this is the area to which the question leads us. Because the man who comes and says, what can I do, I'm miserable, <coughs> give me water, if he goes to a Christian evangelical, the man will very rapidly respond to that appeal. He will say, here is the answer. And if he goes to any other um, proselytizer for any other religion, he will say, here is the answer. So what's wrong with their answers? I mean, I, I can't see that uh, we can dismiss all these answers. No, we are not so much concerned with the validity of the answers. <laughs> if there are answers, is enough. Well, the question we started off with is whether or not there are answers. Is there any way out of this state? Is it possible to undergo a transformation? Um, now, there are many people who say that it is. And they say, this, follow this method, and you will indeed undergo transformation. The question is then, is uh, whether we believe them or not. There are many people who tell us that it's possible to undergo transformation. And in the end, the authority must always be based on those who claim to have undergone it. Um, it seems to me the question is whether we believe them or not. Uh, this, if, if we're trying to answer the question, is it possible? <laughs> I, have, uh, I have left you in at the point at which you accused me of being clever. So I said, no, I mean, it is uh, not only am I not clever, but the entire professional scientists are not very clever. Uh, I'm not talking about scientists. Uh, no, but, but uh, coming back to the thing, it seems to me that the purpose of, um, <coughs> of any organized body of knowledge is to be able to connect together all the things which are known so that they appear as one piece, so that you actually see what are the things which are not understood. And it's also known that, for example, in physical sciences, anything that happens cannot be supernatural. Uh, therefore, ultimate emphasis, ultimate thing, test is in terms of actual things, not in terms of any number of elegant theories which is a very sad thing for a theoretical physicist because many things that we make are so nice, but uh, eventually an experiment comes along and then says, too bad, that's not right. So therefore, all intellectual pursuits are simply methods of shorthand understanding of a whole body of experience that you have. And all experience together is not in terms of knowledge, is simply a premise for perceiving things at a particular time. And the direct perception, the direct experimentation is the only one. And therefore, the prediction of what would happen by following a certain path is always a tentative one. No one can tell you what would happen. One can tell you what is likely, what is probable, what is expected, but ultimately what happens is what happens. And the purpose of science or any organized form of knowledge is therefore not to connect the things together, but in fact find out what are the things which are not yet together. And the transition from a state of awareness of misery, of fragmentation, of, uh, of causal chain in which you are, uh, sequence of events are to take place from which you cannot get out of, from that state of awareness to a state of awareness, in fact, in which there is freedom. Freedom subject to all the constraints that are there. Men, pigs and men don't fly, but, uh, so you don't expect to fly. But if you want to fly, you make another condition in which you get inside an airplane. So, you actually come to a situation in which those things that are according, that are constrained by law, you don't even want to change. And then you find out where is the freedom, where is the little <coughs> chink in the, in the chain so that you may slide through the thing if you want to go up. But any statement by anybody, including oneself, saying it is possible to get out of this misery is tentative until you actually get out. So, sure. distrust about those who have in the past got out. I think this connects with the question that, that our friend here asked. Mm. I mean, it really is an age of skepticism, not merely about the world, but about the past and the present too. And they, why this, this, this inability to say, and yes, I, I think this is absolutely scientific, because it, it is not that it has to happen for the first time. 
Because if we can be skeptical regarding the whole, and I'm not an idolater of the past, but I, let me state this argument. If we can be skeptical about the whole body of the past in respect of this, I don't see how we will accept the results of any successful experiment, even if those results were to stare us in the face. I think we would find a way of doubting them. I mean, I, 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 I worry, uh, George, about the, the experimental model which you propose. Yeah, but at the present time, the problem is not so much the fact that uh, one is skeptical whether it will come through or not. But most people are saying, don't confuse me with facts and processes. I already have a theory saying that it cannot happen. Yeah, the, the thing is to fault that theory. And I think the, the, the theoretical hard work here is simply not being done. I think that's at one level, and we were invited to state as, as scientists, philosophers, and so on, and as, as, as a professional philosopher, if I may be permitted to say this, the theoretical work is simply not fundamental. It's very pernickety, very clever, very good. I mean, I, I've done it myself. But it, it, it's not nearly as fundamental as is required. And there is this gulf between philosophy and science, between science and, and experiment, and, and everything and, and daily living. It's a... And the whole thing reeks of contradiction, and, if, and the modern age is not embarrassed by this. I, mean, I, I find it, it, if it were not so hilarious, it would be tragic, really. Sir, I'd like to ask you for me. Am I agonized by fear? Really agonized. Not verbally, but deeply I feel it's a terrible state to be in fear. You tell me, it's partly good to be in fear. Another tells me, it's good, you can get out, and so on. But the fact remains that I, it is a tremendous agony to be in fear. Help me to get out of it. Don't say you can help yourself and all the rest of it. I, but help me to be free of this burden. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking about war, scientists, uh, it's all the poly you know, all that. I j this is my problem. I come to you as a man who has travelled, who is a scientist, who is blah, all the rest of it. I say, please help me. And you say it's good to be little, have little fear. It's good to have little cancer. Hmm? It's good to be this and good to be that. But I say, please, those are not my questions. It is a tremendous feeling that I have, of inc incredible fear I have. And all that you have told me doesn't affect me. I want to be free of it. It is it's a burning demand. It's not just a pleasant thing to bear, I ask you to help me. <coughs> if you say I can't help you, old boy, I understand that very well. But I come to you because you are all very, etc., and help me. You haven't helped me. So I say, what's the point of all this? I go to her and she says, do this and do that, I might. But at the end of it, I know jolly well that I'm not going to be free of it. So what am I to do? There's death, there's birth. I can go into it all as much as you like, but the fact at the end of all this discussion, literature, science and war, and there is this deep-rooted fear in me. I'm talking of an ordinary human being, not too bright, not too highly educated, he's fairly intelligent, like me, and I say, please, help me to be free of it. That's all my question, I have no other question. Because if I'm free of it, then my life is like the tree. <laughs> Isn't it not 
many people come to me with fear, but uh, I, I could I, talk I, about I, a I have different area. I have come with you. Don't move away. I have come to you with fear. I have never encountered the situation I, when somebody comes. You are encouraging now. Yeah, yeah. No, I think this is a, this no, no. Is going, yeah, very, very fundamental. Because I think it may be, I hope it is an ironical way of getting us to admit that today we do not have such answers. Or, or nobody does. No, and that, that we, no, just a minute. Mm. That I think we are deceiving mm. ourselves. Supposing uh, this is a human situation, somebody comes to me, I may be a professor of X or Y, and say, I have to admit, uh, under present circumstances, that I really do not have that answer. And I think that is a shocking realization. If that absolutely real, poignant inquiry, anybody, an ordinary man, according to Christian, sure. comes to me, sure. and I, I have Dr. to say, no, Dr. I can't. Sebastian said, don't joke with me, you see. He knows me, and I, I have no fear about death, about living, about not... Your I wonderful have... empathy is credible, Krishnaji, and huh? you, you, your wonderful empathy is credible. So your, your, your acting is very real. The acting the part of the miserable man is very real. I don't think it's a joke. Because uh, lots of people have come to see me about fear. Now I'm, I'm taking the part of the man who comes to you and say, please don't talk all this highfalutin stuff. Come down to earth and help me to be free of this monster. And you have nothing to say to me. No, that's not true, but I think the first Say, time, tell me. Yes. Right. Yes. Oh. But I will say that, say I am a Christian evangelical, and I am in fact a Christian. I'm sorry to uh, shock anyone, but um, the, I would say in answer to that, that here is I would say there are answers to this problem which are given by this religion and this faith and by prayer and so on. Ah, uh, I don't accept all that. Ah, well now you see, you said you're the ordinary man. I am the now, ordinary man. Now many ordinary men do accept that. it. I have been through prayers, uh, devotion, uh, a whole lot of that. Well then you're a very extraordinary man with this problem. <laughs> <laughs> You see, you see what they do with me? Yes, you see how they push me off? <laughs> all right. That's I, I don't accept all that. They're only substitute for fear. Oh, In no, this is take... are, Let me finish. They are just surrogate to something which, which is burning me. And I say, look, don't tell me to go and pray. Don't tell me about the Bible. Don't tell me about the position. I don't want any of that. I'm a very sceptical man. I think Christian love would require your acceptance of that self-description. Yes. I think it would. Oh, yes. Oh. And then what would you do? <laughs> Supposing you would do I, that. I don't do? know. I mean, this is a, a hypothetical example. I mean, I, I, think, I think that far from being the ordinary, I think these cases are rare. I think confronted with such a case, I don't know what one would do. I think That's that all I want you to tell me. That's all, right. all I want you to tell me. I don't know what to do with him. All right. Ah, no, stop there. He <laughs> draws Stop the there. You say to my dear chap, I can't, I don't know what to do because I myself haven't resolved it. No, I wouldn't say that. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> Look, surely you would, in relation to such a, a question, you haven't found a way. Have no, what I would... You see the game they're playing with me? <laughs> <laughs> I won't accept this game. I won't accept the ball in my court. I, uh, I, it's in your court. All right. I'd accept the ball in my court, then. What I would say in this situation is that I don't know the answer, but I will pray. All right? If you don't know the answer, tell me. I will say, I don't know the answer. That's all. But I would then say that there's a possibility of an answer. I'm not interested in the possibility. <laughs> I, all that you can tell me is, my dear chap, I don't know. No, I think I do know. Then tell me. You don't accept my answer then. Huh? You, the problem is that I tell you the answer. You say, I don't accept all that. Uh, of course. I don't yeah. accept it. I've tried all those. Well, I might uh, reply, maybe you haven't tried. Ah, right that's way. a trick of the priests. <laughs> I won't accept it. Yes, you but I think it's the enough. trick of the skeptic, you see, to, to reject all things in all ways. And, and 
you know, to... Um, I think that I could answer that, ask that question, couldn't I? I could say, if you said I've tried all this, I could at least inquire. I'm not a priest, so it wouldn't be a priestly trick in the strict sense of the word. I might inquire, you know, in what ways have you tried? And, you know, to find out what sort of trial you've made. I know what I've done. I'll tell you all the human things we do. I've tried to escape. Mm. I've tried to suppress it. Mm. I've tried to tr transmute it by thinking about something else. Mm. I've tried rationalizing. Mm. I've tried prayer. I've tried going to Sudarshan and asking him what science tells me. Mm. I've been to the analyst. I've mm. done all the tricks that human beings have done. At the end of the day, I say I'm stuck where I am. I am afraid. Will you permit, permit me to, uh, to respond to, uh, to your question? Uh, unless uh, offends. Well, no, I mean, I, I've. Um, <clears throat> no, I mean, I've got nothing more to add at present. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Krishnaji, if, if, if you were to, in, in that <clears throat> extraordinarily moving fashion, to come to me and say what you've It's just... not moving, it's dreadful. It, it's moving to me. Now, you must accept my, uh, my response also. I, I find it dreadful and moving. Because, but I would say. In, in the light of what, what I understand, I would say that first, that this simply cannot be you speaking, because... You? It, but just let, let, let uh, me I, I didn't hear it. That, that to which you attribute all this fear, that in you, to which you attribute all this fear, is not ultimately real. Oh. I would say this. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yes. I, I'd like to know if you have tried yes, that. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Then I'd like to hear from you. If you have really tried and rejected the, 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 the thought that that in me, to which I attribute this radical misery, is at bottom unreal. If you have tried and rejected that, I would like to learn from you, because I have uh, not rejected it. That's just an idea. It. I don't... To me, that is the bottom. Pardon? No, but to me... Fear is, to me, the bottom of all my life. Yes, but this, this you... You may call it... Basically, there is no... At the bottom, there is no fear. Basically. No. Fear may be superficial, uh, illusion. But deep down there is no fear. I say I've touched the bottom of my life. No, I don't say that. I'm saying that you have not touched the bottom of yourself. Ah, uh -huh, that's myself is fear. I've touched that blasted thing. Yes, but the, the you have not called the bluff of the ego. I, I, that is me. I am the ego. No, but that's the ego that's speaking. The ego yes. is fearful. Yes, you haven't, you haven't called the bluff of, of that, that style of, of announcement <laughs> of the ego, which is its cleverest trick. What do you call bluff? The bluff of the ego that you are not real. This this subject of this total misery is not really me. It is a pretender. And I don't. I don't go in for that. I say that is me. No, but you have. You see, I want to know if you have tried this. As you said, you have tried have, other things. I, I've tried that. That just to me a verbal statement, which has no reality. <laughs> well, but supposing I ask, were to ask you, who is this as as a, a very great thinker of the recent past, uh, Ramana used to ask. Ah. Suppose, no, why, why not? Because look, you, you are come to me for help, and I think what, you may reject it, but not not before receiving it. <laughs> well, not I've before heard, receiving I've it. I've heard all this. You know, but you haven't heard it from me. Ah, <laughs> so supposing I say, well, uh, 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 Krishnaji, uh, why don't you simply ask yourself uh, who, uh, who you are, who, uh, who are in this uh, radical way, miserable. Really, really go uh, into I this tell you, sir, yourself. I inquired that. Ah. I said, who am I? Yes. Am I fear or am I different from fear? Right? right? I say uh, there is no difference between me and fear. I am fear. Is that the real you? I, I'm, uh, that's the only fear I have. No, is that that the only is you? real to me. No, is that the only you you know? That is me. The only you? 
Uh, the other me is conceit, the other me is arrogance, the other me is feeling loneliness. Now this family of me's, is that the only family? That's all I know. Well, I, I would be the skeptic now and question whether you do really know this. Uh -huh. But I must leave it uh -huh. in that. Don't question. <laughs> I must leave it in that. I'm, I am saying, sir, so forgive me. I, there is nothing but fear in me. I don't deny that, but I'm not sure if there is only that you in I you. I told you, I am also... Uh, I have tremendous aspirations. I have tremendous feeling of guilt. I am also vain, arrogant, full of uh, fun if I wanted. And also I am guilty. All the human things I am. I also, I say, I'm also the ultra superior entity. I include all that you have said to me, I am that. You, you can't really say that, because that ultra superior entity is not the ego which uh, which and glories it glories see? in its just a minute, which glories in its superiority. So I, I would simply say as the skeptic, Krishnaji, your ego is playing tricks with itself. All right, it's playing tricks uh, with itself. Then it is, it is, it is reducing the, hey. the, the, the true answer to a caricature of it. It may be playing tricks with itself, but the end of the day, I am still with what, that burden of fear. Yeah. Sir, may I say one thing? You have been asking this question. I come to you and say, tell me how to be free of fear. I'll tell you. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't come that way to me. I'm coming. All right. <laughs> but you see, what, what I was trying to point out is, <coughs> you, you don't help me that way. No, but I'll help. I'll show you. Says, show me. You have your time? Yes. I have time. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. Ah, 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 ah. Not by the watch. <laughs> <laughs> have you time? Yes. Right. Would you admit desire part of fear? Obviously. Huh? Obviously. Time is part of fear. Obviously. Thought is part of fear. So these are the three basic elements of fear. Right? Then you have to see what is desire. We know that. You and I know we have talked about it. So I can skip that. Right? Yeah. Agree? Must I go must you and I go into the question of desire? No, but uh, verbally? I think you should open it up a bit more. Ah, all right. Desire is is the beginning of thought when it creates the image out of the sensation. Huh? Except that? Yes. Obviously, if you look into yourself, you I am, You have asked me if you can be free of fear. Yes. And I said, that is the beginning of fear. Yes. One of the elements of fear, that desire. Desire is when thought takes charge of sensation and creates the image out of that sensation. Right? Yes. Then time is part of fear. Yes. That is the future yes, or the past. The fear is, is the future. Yeah, fear is the, and also the past. No, it, uh, it, no, but fear, of, fear of having done something which is not correct, which yes. is not honorable. I'm using this word, forgive me. Right? Yes. So, time is fear. That is, 
hope is part of fear. Then thought is part of fear. Thinking of the future, which is time plus thought, is the movement of fear. Right? So these are the basic causes of fear. That means the cause, where there is a cause, there is an end to that effect. Right, sir? So, have I really grasped the deep significance of desire? <clears throat> not disciplined desire, not controlled desire, but how desire arises. And before thought takes charge of sensation, to be aware of that hiatus between sensation and thought interfering with. A recapture. You get what I'm saying? That is, I see a beautiful woman or beautiful something. There it is natural sensation. And to be so utterly attentive at that moment, so thought doesn't come in, make an image out of that sensation and pursue that. Right? Am I making this clear? Yes, yes. <coughs> huh? To be so alert, so thought has doesn't interfere with sensation. Fear arises. No, I no, see. No, let These us are the causes of fear. Yeah, but let us say. Wait, wait, let me finish. So that you understand the full movement of desire. Where sensation and thought, rather, thought doesn't come into sensation, make a lovely image out of it. That is the beginning of desire, which is the cause of fear. <coughs> Would you agree to that, sir? Right. Then time is fear. Which is a very complete time. There is no I am time. My thought is time. I am the past, the present and the future. I am the time maker. I, since I am the time maker, I am bound to time. I am the, in bondage to time. Right? Right? And it's not just words. I, I, it has to be in my blood, this thing. Then I say, thought. These three are the basic movement of fear. <coughs> thought, which projects the future, you know all the thought you want to do. If you have understood, you are not understood if you have grasp the fullness of it, there is no fear at all. Sir, it seems to me that there is a primordial fear in which there is no conscious time, thought or desire. Primordial fear? Primordial in the sense of <coughs> something which seems to come from an ancient past, I from think, the unknown, yeah, yes, the fear yes, of not yes. being. Perhaps. Fear of, that is it. I, that fear of being is time. Being is time. Right, sir? And not being is time. Right? 
when I wonder when that is in, in my breath, fear there is no fear. I I think there is some difference. I see something beautiful. The That's all. Sensation. sensation. Yes, I agree. Stop there. Yes. Stop there. No, I'm just trying to analyze it. <coughs> there is sensation. Then thought makes an image. Already time has the thought, come into being. No, that is thought is time. The thought is not separate from time. They are both movements. <coughs> Therefore, they're, that is time. It's time, thought are not different. I, uh, yes, yes, I see so that. But I think there is a fear uh-huh. where there is n- no such movement. It, it seems to come from some deep... Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I d- I'm seeing... I won't, I won't accept any primordial uh, deep down. This is the only fear I have. The unknown and the known. So long as you have not given up the thought that you are the proper subject of time, thought, and desire, this fear may come back, or it may come back. Ah, no, just a minute, sir. No, let me complete. Ah, sorry. Let me complete. <laughs> so long as the thought is there in your mind, that of course you were the absolutely legitimate object, recipient of this. There may be a temporary relief from this. It may be of a a splendid kind while it lasts. So long as you haven't seen that you are not this body, or that you are not at all, just a minute, or that you are not at all. If you have merely overcome by a process of analysis at a given point in time. No, sir. No, sir. You are assuming and forgive me if I may be wrong, you are assuming something beyond my comprehension, that there is something primordial freedom, primordial divinity or something. I, am, I, I merely go from fact to fact. The fact as it happens. Yes, but this, if I may say so, I mean, I think there is something a, a prima facie presumptuous about suggesting that there shall be no fear. I think there is no more presumption in what I have suggested than in what you did. But I think neither is presumptuous. Uh, neither position I don't, is... I don't... I'm censor. I'm just, I don't understand what you're well, saying. Well, it's my fault. My fault. Let me try no, again. No, please. Uh, let me try again. It's my fault, assuredly. Now, you, uh, in, in your... Uh, 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 in your... Uh, very wonderfully uh, uh, helpful uh, conversation just now, you said that if you can, if you can see this, that this is the, this is the movement of fear. Yes. End of phrase. Yes. Uh, thought, desire, time. Then fear shall end. Now I think this this proclamation uh, or this this, uh, uh, this this prospect that fear shall end can sound. Uh, very, uh, very presumptuous to, to, to people can, precisely in the way in which the thought that this this illusory I, which regards itself as the proper subject of all this, will cease. I think they are, they are on the same level, and I think they are not really a, 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 a presumptions at all. I think there are really these two uh, uh, amargas, and I think you, you, what you presented. Now I'm not quoting scripture or authority. I don't think that it's about time that the complementarity of, of, of the two margas be explored rather than a, 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 a mutual a, a rift sustained. I, I do think that the, the, the moment the, 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 the essential uh, uh, movement of fear is seen, that at that very moment the, the ego dies. I and am if it's that, survived, sir. I am sir. desire, I am thought, I am time, I am there. No, but if you're still there, after this discovery, I, I'm afraid that the news isn't good enough. No. So may I say yes. one thing? This movement which has been explored, is the eye is not separate from that movement. Let's see. When a statement is made that fear ends, this movement ends, and with the movement, ending of this movement, time ends, in that sense, in his sense. Now, the question which I think would be relevant would be, 
with the ending of that is there the void of nothingness because when it, it the, after all this is the veil this is the illusion when you talk of um, without even making the statement of that the illusion which hides if you say that there is this super light there is something which is covering that light what is covering the light is this movement is it also the ego is my simple question for Putin. if it is the ego survives this secession i'm afraid that's not good enough news no, for me but it, uh, can it survive if or if it doesn't if, if it doesn't then the other marga the other path the other movement that well it was never real at any point in time at all no, but you can, if you start from saying it is nev it is not real you'll never see this no, i think the two must go side, side by side all i'm suggesting is that that we uh, I mean, this is a crude uh, 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 phrase we we uh, <clears throat> Uh, we put all our resources together, and I do suggest, no, no, I do suggest that the one, the actual undertaking of, of this, this marvelous process, uh, uh, briefly, but, but so, so powerfully uh, introduced by uh, Krishnaji, and the conviction for those who share it, and I think there are millions who do this, that this ego was never real anyway. I think the two can go together, and in a pincer movement, bring freedom, I think. But if you, if you, if you pursue only the one, and, and mind you, in, 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 somewhat, in somewhat unfortunate rejection of the other, then I think that would be a that would be a false move. That would take a great deal of discussion, you know, to no, go doubt. into no these doubt. two. It would take a tremendous. <laughs> I would just like to say that we get the constituents. When we get the constituents, what is the importance of the name? After all, when we use the word ego, the ego is after all a concept. Now I get the constituents and I get the constituents and I say that time is the factor of fear. And I brood over it, I ponder over it because it is the toughest nut to crack. Then I hear that thought is fear. Now. When I get each of the constituents and I examine each of the constituents and I am very critical, very skeptical and I say that each of the constituents has validity because it is part of my being. It is not external as well as not internal. It is. It is. When I have said this, is there any meaning left to naming? If I have examined the parts, is there any meaning attached to naming? Because then what I have to get rid of is naming. See, but supposing uh, you were to, you were to <coughs> begin with, uh, supposing I were to say, uh, not with the authority of a jnani, but as, as, as one, just a moment. Supposing I were to say, the ego is fear. Now, I think in the same tone of voice. Indeed. Ego is fear. Right, very good. Now, but this is the first time I'm hearing this word from you today. Mm -hmm. But I think if, you, if, Krishna, if it were came with the authority of Krishna, uh, I, I think... Krishna uh, uh, I'm sorry. No, but this word, that, this phrase, that the ego is fear, today I've heard from the first, for the first time from you. Yes, now, sure. now, I think if you were to now address this very sentence, along with the other three, no, but, no, no, but I think I'm addressing Krishna here, but please give me one minute. Now, I think that the, what I was suggesting in my own clumsy way, it has been now, I think, uh, 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 unclumsied by you. In, in, in that simple phrase, the ego is fear. Now, if the ego is fear, then one should begin with this, that naming is fearing. Uh, Achyuchi. Supposing one begins with this thought also. Now, what one, one has to, 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 to go through this, this movement of overcoming the movement, now, in addition to the mantras, uh, uh, forgive me, I will use those, uh, regard uh, the, the statements, thought is fear, uh, uh, desire is fear, time is fear, as three mantras, or avakya, mahavakyas. <laughs> now, supposing you have the fourth mahavakya, the ego is fear. I think that is almost like the four Vedas. I don't know what <laughs> we will 
But I think you need the fourth Veda also. We won't enter into the semantics of it. No, but you are. Here you you're see. talking about naming and you, no, can't, no. you can't deny semantics. No I, am, no, I am saying that for the time being, we have moved along a certain line and we have come up to that point. Then I say that if we also give up naming at that point, yes. then perhaps does it leave us at a point which Pupulji has very validly raised that where are you then? Is there a void? No, but that, it, that's another a very answer. important but question. Void, again, why, why anticipate the void? But if you no. were skeptical about naming from the start, then I think no. your capacity to give it up would be great. This. Part of this. Yes. So, so is the ego now? The fourth mantra, please. The, the, the ego is fear. I, I insist on, on bringing it into the discussion. Yes. But I would like to also, in, I won't enter into it, but I want to tell Krishna that there is a fifth element which is un, maybe unrelated to these four, but is being stated by Krishnaji, and that is that there is a meditation of the universe. There is a meditation of the universe. With the ending of this, there is a... Now, you have to take it... If, can you take all this together? I would have paraphrased her in another <laughs> word, which I think might be helpful. My only excuse for speaking is that it might be. I say that when you have arrived at that point, there is the non-divisive existence. These are all words, darling. Yeah, I, so. I, I, I realize the time is practically up, but uh, I would like to say that this is like the Columbus said. If, if somebody came to me and then said, I am in mortal fear, I would first say, my friend, I don't know anything to help you, but please tell me. Probably I would have gone somewhere along the way, not so clearly, not so specifically. No. However, I wonder how many common people I, how many common people can benefit from such a thing? Wouldn't they say, Krishnaji, you are a great man, but these are words. I have, I am in tremendous fear, I am in agony. Please help me, don't tell me all this I semantics. Won't, I won't tell him all this. Hmm. What will you do? Hold his hand. Yes. Yes. 